Today on Larry King Now, we're in London with the great British Bake Off's Mary Berry and photographer and cookbook author Mary McCartney. I'm told that you're not easy on the contestants. We have a very high standard, but I don't want to be unkind to them. I want to encourage them to do even better. And so I don't think I'm the tough one. On their food. I am a lifelong vegetarian, and I don't really like to preach to people and say, you should be vegetarian, and do you know what it's doing to the planet? And their fame. I've got a husband at home, and I'm not used to leaving him. Is he proud of his famous wife? Um. He's never said that he is, but he's very nice, and I love going back to him. Plus... I recently um, took portraits of the Queen. The palace released them as the photographs to mark her as the longest reigning monarch in history. So that was very daunting. All next on Larry King Now. Welcome to a very special edition of Larry King Now. We are shooting today from across the pond in beautiful London, England. Our first guest has been described as the doyenne of family cookery, best-selling author, entrepreneur, and TV personality, Mary Berry. Mary is a judge on the BAFTA award-winning BBC series, The Great British Bake Off. It now airs on PBS in the United States. By the way, the season six finale of Bake Off racked up 15 million viewers here in the UK. Later in the show, I'll speak to photographer and cookbook author Mary McCartney, the daughter of Sir Paul McCartney. Thank you so much, Mary Berry. And I understand that this, unlike reality shows in America, this is a cordial show. The contestants like each other. It's not vicious. Do you know, it, it's, it's a very calm uh, uh, show, and they like each other. They uh, even share, you know, when they're actually baking and, and they want to use a particular cutter or uh, tin, they'll take it away and the other one will wait. It's um, really friendly. There's no swearing. It, it, they help each other. It's very unusual, but the great thing is it's encouraged everybody in Britain to bake. You know, our supermarkets have the, the sales are right up of cooking equipment and ingredients for baking. And, you know, once they watch the show, it's a family show, and you get the granny, you get the family and the children all sitting together, because in England we don't now all sit for Sunday lunch. And it's a real get-together of all ages. And um, I always think of it as a teaching show. And what does the winner get? The winner gets uh, a great accolade, <laughs> uh, but he just gets a, a glass cake stand. No money, no nothing, just the honour of being um, a winner. And then usually they get asked to do a cookbook. They're famous. They've been watched by 15 million viewers. Are they all amateur bakers? That's the great thing. They're all amateur bakers. They must not have been to college. They must not be professional. It's, uh, they check on all that. So they come as amateur bakers, just keen bakers. And actually, the standard has gone up. What We're on six now. Um, it's gone up because people watch it and they think they want to enter. I mean, we get 12,000 entries. What made Mary Berry a baker? Um, do you know, at school, I wasn't very good at the academic subjects. And uh, we uh, had a, a domestic science, we call it, teacher, who was a little round lady who was a great teacher. And she praised what I did. And nobody had ever praised my Latin and maths. <laughs> now, the show, I understand, is coming to America with an adaptation called The Great Holiday Baking Show. You'll be judging with Nia Vardalos. Yes. From my big fat Greek wedding. Did you shoot this in America? No, we shot it here because we wanted it to be as much like the Bake Off that everybody loves. And we used the same venue, the same tent, but it was quite different because it's Christmassy. And we had a Christmas tree, and instead of the bunting with the. Um, uh, uh, flags. It was bunting, a sort of Christmas design. And it has this great spirit, and everybody's rather excited. And we did Christmas bakes. If it's a big hit, Mary Berry, would you come to America to do a show? I so like doing it here. I perhaps could be tempted, but uh, I've got a husband at home, and I'm not used to leaving him. And what does he do? 
Uh, he is an antiquarian book dealer and picture dealer. Is he proud of his famous wife? Um, he's never said that he is, but he's very nice, and I love going back to him. <laughs> you have children? I have uh, children. I've got two children. I think they're quite proud, and they, they love to cook and to bake. Is baking an art or a science? I think, you know, it's a little bit of both. It is a science because the one thing baking is that you've got to weigh uh, accurately to get good results. Now, Johnny, the, the judge, the other judge, he does everything in grams. I know you do it in cups. Um, and, of course, I had to learn the different ingredients. And when we shot the um, program, we were very careful to see that they had all our bakers, our six bakers had exactly the ingredients they wanted and that they were used to. They also, some of them brought their own rolling pins and cutters and things because we wanted them to be at home. I'm told that you're not easy on the contestants. Do you know, the one thing that I am is fair. And that's something, um, on the show, nobody but the two judges chooses who goes home eliminated. And we have a very high standard, but I don't want to be unkind to them. I want to encourage them to do even better. And so I don't think I'm the tough one. The shows we'll see in America are already done? We have just completed them. Were they all Americans? All Americans, all six were Americans. And ups. Do you know, I was most nervous of having a different judge alongside me, wonderful Johnny. And um, uh, I was sort of nervous because I thought the standard wouldn't be good, but it was. They were so inventive and also very lively, and they got on like a house on fire. What makes a great cake? Well, first of all, you've got to look good to tempt Look you to counts. eat it, okay. looking counts. And then when you cut into it, it's got to have that sort of wow factor. We'll be right back in a minute. Our guest is the great British Bake Off's Mary Berry. After the break, we'll talk about Mary's baking beginnings, and we'll find out what tops her list of baking faux pas. Stay with us. We're with Mary Berry. She's the host of The Great Bake Off on British TV, and now she's coming to America with The Great Holiday Baking Show. It'll premiere November 30th on ABC with six Americans vying to be the best. What do the, the they win? Same thing? Um, same thing sort of thing. Nothing grand, no money. They do it for love. <laughs> you had a job, I'm told, showing people how to use their ovens? You know, I started having been trained, and I would, I'm really lucky to have a good training because it gives one confidence. And um, I, my very first job was working for the electricity board, and in England years ago, if you bought a cooker and you weren't quite happy with it, I would go and make a Victoria sandwich, which is um, a fairly plain cake, and just show them how to bake. And if the oven wasn't right, it would be replaced. My wife is a great baker. She's, she's great. Is it natural? Can you be a naturally great baker? You can be a naturally great baker, but you have to follow a good recipe. Um, with baking, it is a matter of accuracy. And if you don't add a raising agent or something, well, it won't rise. Why couldn't we all do it the same? I measure this, I measure that, I measure this, I put it together, we all make the same cake. You could do very well if you followed a good recipe. So what makes one better than the other if we can all measure? Um, in fact, a lot of people don't measure, and also they, uh, the techniques, you need a bit of judgment. You know, if you're making a meringue, you've got to uh, beat it for the right amount of time, and um, if you overbeat it, it, the texture would change. So you've just got to learn a technique. What's the hardest cake to bake? I think many people find a Genoese, which is a very rich sponge that you have to put uh, butter at a certain temperature into it, mix it too much, and it flops. What's easy to bake? The easiest For you, what's thing. It? The, oh, I can whip up a, a Victoria sandwich. That's uh, a that's a cake. That's a cake or a muffin. American muffins are very easy to make. What's your favorite tool? I am afraid I use a mixer because I can be doing other things while the mixer's going. Um, and I believe that it does it just as well as my mother would have beaten it. What's your favorite cake? My favorite? To eat. To eat lemon drizzle cake. 
Lemon drizzle cake is, what is a... What do you mean drizzle? <laughs> drizzle, exactly. Um, it's a cake that you bake, a fairly plain sponge, uh, you make with butter, and then you mix lemon and sugar, and while it's warm, you put it on top, and the lemon seeps into the cake, and you get a crusty topping. It's so simple, and I love it. I love lemon meringue. Lemon meringue pie. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great one. That is a great one. Is, this it is, as, is it as famous with you as with us? Oh, it's famous with us. What's a cake you don't like? Oh, do you know, I don't like seed cake. I have hmm. to keep quite a seed, um, caraway seed in a cake. I don't like caraway. For, a, for the people learning to bake, what's the hardest way to start? What's the most difficult thing that people have trouble getting? I would say for people who are starting to bake, um, find something that you yourself enjoy um, and that's fairly simple. Uh, usually, with children baking, they make something like uh, cupcakes. Those are little individual cakes and in a paper case so it doesn't stick. And they proudly make it and you share it. You give it as a present. I think it's a, the perfect thing to start with. Is there a dessert you have never mastered? One that you say, I I don't do this well. Um, I can't think. I don't make an awful lot of desserts. Um, I think sponge sugar on top of things. Um, I rarely do. The chefs do it. If I do sponge sugar at home, perhaps to put it on uh, top of um, a, a special French pudding or something, um, I go outside with my... Um, caramel and I have my rolling pin and I do it outside in the, uh, the house on the lawn so that any that drops isn't on my kitchen floor. You bake at home? Oh yes, I bake. But all the time? Not all the time, but I'm very lucky to have uh, children and grandchildren who love what I cook. Are you a tough judge in restaurants? Do you know, I'm so grateful to go to restaurants and it's more about the company than the food. So who you're with matters more than oh, what yes, you're eating. Oh, yes, I think so. I love to go with friends and family, and I love good food, but I'm not too fussy. How come there are specialty cooks, cooks who just do desserts? Well, it's like, it's like chefs, isn't it? You, you know, you're, you're, you specialise in a certain thing, and uh, I've specialised lately in baking um, because I've mastered the art of it, and uh, I enjoy it, and I enjoy the research. And it's very rewarding when people say, that was good. Is there any non-fattening cake? I can't think of what... I mean, as soon as you add sugar and things like that You're to dead. it. But I will say to people, just have a small slice. Don't go back for a second slice. Why do you have all these pictures? Those are all the people who were in the Bake Off 6. And, you know, they're, they're always different. Um, uh, he's a fireman um, and he's an anaesthetist and uh, all different jobs and they manage to fit in their love of baking. And that's the same when we had the holiday bake-off. We had all, we had a nurse, we had all sorts of different people and they all muck in, but they have this huge bond of baking. You're a great guest, Mary Berry. Thank you, Larry. I want to thank my guest, the scrumptious Mary Berry. The Great British Bake Off airs on BBC One in the UK and on PBS in the United States. It's also available on Netflix. The Great Holiday Baking Show will premiere November 30th on ABC. Up next, we're talking to another beloved Britisher, Mary McCartney. We'll be right back, right after this. Joining me now, one of the most acclaimed photographers in the United Kingdom. She's also a philanthropist and the author of her latest vegetarian cookbook, At My Table, Vegetarian Feasts for Family and Friends. She's Mary McCartney. Her father and brother are into music, sister an accomplished fashion designer, your mother a photographer. Is this in the genes? I think so. <laughs> I think it's something I, I didn't realize it until um, I grew up around photography and seeing beautiful photographs and I thought everyone could do it. But you grew up around music, didn't you? I grew up around music, but it was also just very visual. I think for me, my mum took me into a dark room once and one of my earliest memories is seeing a piece of paper going into a 
a little tray and then suddenly an image coming magically appearing on it. So I think it really captured my imagination. What fascinates you about the camera? Um, the challenge. It's very, very difficult to be a photographer of people and to get what I want, which is like a, an intimacy and a moment. It's kind of easy to like light someone and get a happy, happy shot or, you know, the look someone wants to do, but to gain someone's trust and actually take a photograph that I'm going to like, they're going to like, and someone else is going to find interesting is like a lifelong challenge. I've asked this of other great photographers. I wonder what you think. Give me a great photographer with an ordinary camera or a regular person with a great camera. Oh, interesting. I think a great photographer with an ordinary camera, because it's about the eye. It's the eye the of vision. the photographer. Yeah, I think so. I think it's the vision. Annie Leibovitz told me that the i6 is the best camera now. I have to get off my iPhone 6. I do a whole thing on Instagram called, um, on my Instagram account, which has become quite popular, called hashtag someone. And it's portraits of people that I see and come across. Like, I should have it now. I should take one of you today. But I take, it's a very quick, spontaneous picture, which I put onto Instagram instantly. And it's called hashtag someone. And, it, and everyone puts very good comments. But it, yeah, I have to get off my iPhone and back onto my. <laughs> you photographed everything from the Royal Ballet to Prime Ministers, Jude yeah. Law and Ralph Fiennes, life street scenes. And the Queen. Anything you prefer? Any, do you prefer people to places? I, yes. If I have to describe myself, I call myself a portrait photographer, but then I also catch moments around it. So if I was taking a photograph of you now, I'd probably take a detail of your tie and your bracelets and your watch to catch a bit of you, a bit of a narrative. I like images which have a narrative or a story. That, so I always think of someone looking at my picture and sort of being lost in sort of a story from their past or a memory. I like it to evoke a memory or a feeling. So when you look at people, do you look at them or do you think of them being photographed? I look at them and then I kind of look at them and think, what's their story? And often people open up to me and will tell me about themselves. I'm really interested in people's stories. So the book for the, that sparked this exhibition at the Gagosium is called Monochrome and Colour. And that is, I went through every single contact sheet I'd ever taken and I picked out moments and, and memories and captured situations and, and quite intimate situations that would spark a viewer's imagination. Kind of very unproduced, very kind of very natural. Very, you know, I'm looking for moments. It's the hardest thing to get. Are photographers storytellers? The ones that I'm interested in are. Not all of them are. Some of them aren't. But the ones that I find, like, I want to eat their photographs, they're so gorgeous, usually are storytellers. They evoke a feeling in you. Elvis Costello chose your portrait of him for the back cover of his new autobiography. Yeah, that was so lovely. He wrote a lovely email saying, look, would you mind terribly if I have to, you know, ask him? And I was like, are you kidding? I'd be <laughs> honored. Do you like to know about the people you're shooting? Yes, I do. I recently um, took portraits of the Queen to mark the, um, they released the, the palace released them as the photographs to mark her as the longest reigning monarch in history. So that was very daunting. I didn't have very long, and I did it all available light, and I did it very natural. And I actually photographed it on film. Meaning? Instead of digital, because I kind of still, I do digital and film, but I do like to concentrate on film. So you had to use the that light was that was scary. there. quite scary. I couldn't... used the, the light that was there. Why didn't they let you light it? Um, because I think the reason that they asked me to take portraits of her is because um, she didn't want any fuss and she didn't want a big setup and she didn't want the distraction. And, and also for me, it was about her going about her duties as normal, not a big formal portrait. It was her with her red box at her desk, um, very natural and very real. Your photo of a four-year-old boy was recently projected onto the side of a university building in the UK. Yes. How did that come about? That was um, an adoption. The adoption agency in the UK asked me because little boys at the age of four apparently are um, unado you know, very, very low rate of adoption. So I think yeah, they sure. wanted to bring that up. Because their and personalities formed already. Yeah, their personalities formed. And I think they think at four, like we would look at a little four-year-old 
child in the street and think, what a cute baby. But apparently, if you're adopting, yeah, and it is very complicated with adoption. It's four years. You like shooting children? I do. I don't think it would be my chosen career path, but when I do it, I love it. But it's quite tiring because you have to. Oh yeah. You know, you have to. But the the I, the boy that I photographed for the adoption campaign was like magical. He I looked. understand you work with children's charities. You work with charity that provides cleft palate operations. Yeah. You know, I love those doctors who yeah. go around the world. Smile doing train. That. Amazing. Yeah. And I did, I was lucky I did it in a nice way when they approached me and um, I thought I'm going to go around the world and it's going to be very depressing, children that need the yeah. enhancement. But actually, we went to China, Russia, um, and met the children that had had the operations, so it was seeing the positive impact on their family. Which, and you... I got to drive out to a little village in China and spend the day with their grandparents and the kids. And What do you look for in a photograph? I think something to evoke some kind of emotion. I don't, like, I, if I'm flicking through a magazine, I want a picture to arrest my attention. I, when I take a picture, I want someone to become engaged with it. I wouldn't want someone to just turn past it and be bored. I want to like, I want some emotion. And I like collaboration. I like working with people. Really? Yeah. Has Instagram and those things affected photography a lot? Um, yes, they have. But I think it's, it's not all negative. It's positive as well. It's a great way of communicating. And I think there's a lot of great pictures. But there's a lot of material, so it's hard to find the good stuff. Do you hate selfies? I don't hate selfies. I, I, don't, I don't really post them of myself. I think it's a little cheesy, but if someone else does it, I don't mind. Up next, Mary and I will talk about her new vegetarian cookbook. Don't go away. Welcome back to Happy Larry Now. Happy Larry is a phrase here. In Britain, yes. Right? It's if you're happy, you're happy as Larry. Yeah. So Larry means happy, not Harry, Larry. Well, the phrase is, I'm happy as Larry. Do you know where that comes from? No. I would mm. say it's something to do with, like, East London, the old Cockney days. Oh, really? But I don't know. Okay. I don't know. Don't, don't hold me to that. What led to the second vegetarian cookbook, At My Table, Vegetarian Feasts for Family and Friends? Well, that's a very good question. As a photographer, I'm quite busy. Um, but I am a lifelong vegetarian and I don't really like to preach to people and say you should be vegetarian and do you know what it's doing to the planet, the industry, the meat industry. And so what I did was I was asked to write a vegetarian cookbook and I did. It was a lot more work than I thought it would be, but it made me really think about what I cook and look at ingredients and balanced menu plans, which at my table is menu plans for occasions where you can choose one recipe or you can do the whole menu plan. And what's the second book? That's at my That's table. It, the food was like just like a, oh. quite a, a, a I get it. Um, normal kind of cook, but this one is more menu plans. And now I've also just to create a bit more work for myself, do a food blog called P4 Peckish, <laughs> where I upload a recipe each week. Can you make vegetarian dishes that meat lovers would love? That's my aim. My aim isn't, because I'm too busy anyway, my aim isn't to do vegetarian cooking for vegetarians in a way. I am more trying to entice people that are interested in becoming more vegetarian over and showing menu solutions, because it can be difficult to think of recipes if you're used to cooking meat and fish. Would it be easy to train a great chef to cook vegetarian? Yeah, there's a lot of great chefs that are interested in vegetarian cooking now, more and more. There's not, I, what, it, what is good is like when I was a child, like growing up as a vegetarian, it felt very much us and them. And I would find I'd go for dinner and people would start harassing me, like, why are you vegetarian and do you wear leather and blah, blah. And I'm like, you know, leave, leave me alone. And now it, I really, don't get that ever anymore. It's much more, oh, no, I know this amazing restaurant that's got loads of vegetarian options and chefs doing vegetarian cookbooks. And what do you think of vegans? I think it's a good way of eating, but you need to be with any diet. You just need to make sure you have a balanced range of everything. But, yeah, I think it's... And in New York, it's like a huge food... Yeah. Um, fad over... Well, not fad, but it's like lots of restaurants have vegan menus and signs all over the place. Is it hard to photograph dishes? I have to admit, I hate doing food photography. I shouldn't say it, but I do it because I know how I like it to Why look. Why do you hate it? 
Oh, because it's too... Um, for me, it's not spontaneous enough. It's like, should the fork be here or should the fork be there? It's not. But when I do enjoy it, what I do like to do is my food photography, I, I'll test the recipe, I'll make it, I'll put it on a plate and dress it a little bit and then I'll photograph it and then we'll eat it. So that's how I do my food photography and that's how I enjoy doing it. On the book, you told the Telegraph, it's so much work. It's writing the recipes and taking the pictures and food photography is not spontaneous. Mm -hmm. Why did you have someone else take the pictures? Because I wanted to have photographs of pretty much all of the recipes and it's not really practical um, to do that. It would have taken too many days. And also I just found a good technique in like photograph, like doing the recipe, testing the recipe, photographing the recipe and then moved on and just that was my method. Lighting important there. Well, what I did was I did it in the kitchen. I just put it on the windowsill in the natural daylight. So then none of them are lit. Keep it simple. In the United States, I'm told there are now 16 million vegans or vegetarians, a 4% yeah. increase in only six years. I know. Why the increase? Do you, I, you know what? I was actually in New York recently because um, I've got this, show, this photography exhibition of Mother Daughter, which we, was this connection between my mum and the first time I've actually curated an exhibition of her photography and my photography together. So I was going out to the Gagosian to look at the space and um, I saw vegan signs everywhere I went, sort of walking around the streets. And I was saying to people, why? Because it's not the same in England. I don't think vegan is seen as more, I am a committed vegan and it's quite serious. Whereas in, in America, they were saying it's just seen as a healthy way of eating. Yeah. So people that aren't vegan will go to vegan places. Are you places a vegan? And... No, I'm not, but I could be. I'm not, I, I eat eggs. Mm. I like to eat eggs. Brit Morrissey, who I know you, you know, mm -hmm. a fellow Brit. He recently, we recently had him as a guest. Love and he, him. And he got into the negative environmental impact that meat yeah. has on the planet. Yeah. He is wild on the subject. But that's the thing is I don't disagree with him at all, but did that make you want to go vegetarian? Having him say that to you. No. I just, my, my thing is I do agree that I, the reason I'm vegetarian is because I do think it's negative impact on the planet and I'm, but I don't think that's an angle to get people involved so much. Those facts are very much accessible on the internet and there's a lot of people putting out those um, reports. So my way of doing it is then saying, hmm, Larry, try this chestnut and uh, mushroom and leek pie. It's lovely. And then you go, oh, actually, that's really nice. And it's vegetarian and it was satisfying. What do you make of the, the word, no, the hot dogs are bad, bacon's bad, processed meats cause cancer? Uh, I think processed anything too much isn't good for us. Um, I don't know. I mean, for me, it means that maybe people will try more vegetarian alternatives, which is good. But, you know, I think each individual needs to look at what they want to eat and why they want to eat it. And just maybe try and think about where your food is coming from. Is your dad uh, a vegetarian? You know, yeah, we all are. Yeah. That's right. I've at the moment, all of us, yeah, he is. He and my mum were the first um, vegetarians in the family and then we've kind of carried it on. And then when, so I grew up as a vegetarian and when I left home, um, I then thought of it as an adult. I thought, do I want to be vegetarian and why? And I decided yes, because I, I think it's really enjoyable. I don't look at it as a negative or that I'm lacking anything. Your mother was an amazing woman. Was she not? Yes, thank you. They were a Shake great... with you on that one. They were a great couple. Yeah. Yeah, they were very in love and they were, you know, they'd always be discussing things and getting excited about things. And, you know, it's good. You it was good her. to grow up around that. Yeah, I really miss her. That's why I was with this exhibit, this photography exhibition. I, the Gagosian, I, I was called in for a meeting and they were like, we'd like you to do an exhibition of your images with your mother's photography and I had to think about it and they asked me to sort of do my suggested curated edit. I found it quite difficult to get started because it's quite emotional looking through all of her work but then I realized the connection between our photographs so I've hung I'm going to hang it in a way where our photo it's two rooms so I didn't know one room would be my photographs one room would be hers but actually I'm going to do groupings and of our photographs together so you can see the narrative between it had us. a great effect on you then yeah she's always with me
Thank you, doll. Thank you. Say hello home. I will. I want to thank my guests earlier, Mary Berry and Mary. It's a Mary Day and Mary McCartney. And remember, you can find me on Twitter at King's Things. Cheers from London. I'll see you next time. <laughs>